How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Uh, but said earlier, we haven't slept much. Uh, we have a turnaround day today for a film that we've been working on. Um, our latest one, hopefully we can get it out by Halloween time. So. Oh, cool. What kind of a movie is it? It's called Forsaken, and um, we're actually doing it through Uncourt Entertainment, and it's pretty much about a priest whose wife becomes deathly ill, so he turns his back on God and decides to possess her to try to save her life, and in turn, damns his soul. So, you know, we're dealing with demons and, you know, a lot of <laughs> spiritual entities, and, and it's late night with it, so it's, it's very uh, it kind of taxing. It stays on your brain all day. Oh, I got you. I understand. Yeah, I've been like yourself. I've been uh, I've been indie filmmaker for thirty years, so I know exactly what it what it's like to have to stay up all night long working on something. Oh my god, that is so awesome! I, I I really do. That's so great that you make films because that means that you you know you put your hands on it, so you have such a great perception and perspective on things. So when you ask, you know, obviously when you do this type of thing, when you interview us, and thank you for that. For that. Oh yes, yes. No problem. Like I said, I think I have. Uh, when I speak to a lot of filmmakers and I let them know that I, I do movies as well, I think they, they, like yourself, are kind of like, well, that's cool because I can relate on so many levels. Oh. <laughs> it's almost like a, I can almost relax, you know, and put all my sheets down and just sit back and, and, and kick it because I, I think you completely get it. You know, I have not napped. My words are going to blur over top of each other, and I'm eating yeah. a lot of snacks next to the computer. I know exactly <laughs> that feeling. <laughs> Can you tell our listeners a little about the movie uh, Dark Moon Rising? Dark Moon Rising, which is a werewolf film, is the first in the franchise, and I have to say that because we, we're, intent, we're already in production of part two, heading into part three, 2016, look out for those. And it's, it's about a, a girl named Dawn, played by Anastasia Esper. I'm sorry, Anastasia Antonia. She goes by the last name, not Antonia. She appears in a small town, and she ravages the woods, the forest, she can't control her rage, and, you know, she awakens, and she's trying to discover why she has these certain urges to hurt people. She's, she's trying to avoid people at all costs until she, you know, obviously runs into Chase, uh, played by Cameron White, and into this small town, Blakely, Georgia, and they kind of discover a little bit about each other. You know, they, they're both disassociated from society, and, and they kind of meld in that way. And uh, yeah. what we wanted to do with the film, we wanted to present a film that had a lot of backstory, but we had to put the backstory in the initial film because we did not have, you know, years of comic book history. So, you know, we can't just introduce a cool character and have him pop on screen and, you know, start fighting and, and killing people and taking off heads because true to the form of, of what we wanted to present in the movie, we wanted everything to have a lot of character work and detail, which, right. you know, you kind of get with television and and series and things that you have a lot of time to to develop. That that's why in in this particular film it was very important for us to get a good mix of entertainment, uh, action, horror, and also story. So it it seems like a lot of things are happening at once, and and that that was on purpose. And we kind of we're trying to execute a, a variety of, of things. Is the, the layout, the universe, why the werewolves, why do they change, uh, why is he not controlling the rage? You know, all these things that kind of come together are going to culminate into a nice bow once the franchise is completed and, and once we, we have a, a few more films to, to really delve deeper into it. So this right. is almost that initial, just the initial introduction to the characters. And so it's just essentially about her trying to discover why she has these abilities and and then why she's being chased by a pack of rebel werewolves. And the interesting thing about the werewolves uh, that separates, you know, pretty much what we wanted to introduce into the genre yeah. was we wanted our werewolves to pretty much have this anime feel, this, this enthused energy where they come from different packs, you know, where there's, there's the wolves in China would be different from the wolves in Africa. And, and that was kind of the play on that. So Gecko would be... You know, he, he has uh, his powers and abilities. It's not really a a special power. It's more of a tribal trait, like an inherited trait that is only, right. you know, for that pack of werewolves because that's how they survived in Africa. You know, that's what they would use. So, you know, and so the, throughout the film, different parts, K.O. played by Ku um, and Gecko played by Matthew Simmons, uh, they, they pretty much, they, they, they use their, their uh, ability to help 
chase Don Tracker, and they've been tracking us for a while. And throughout the film, you'll, you'll notice why or get a hint as to her importance. But that's an interesting take. I like that, you know, because like you said, most werewolf movies, werewolves are werewolves, but the fact that you kind of added that aspect to it makes it even more interesting. And like you said, if you're doing a part two and three, you'd be able to expand on that somewhat. Man, werewolves in general, there's so many great films before this one and, and including this one. There's so many great franchises that really give us just a, a wonderful take on the folklore. we got transformations from the howling to, you know, Mary yeah. Wells in Paris. It's so, it's so cool how the body just contorts and then they come out. And, and, and you know, you have the, the certain elements that everyone's used to seeing, um, the, the strength, the teeth, the, the change in the fur, and the, the in heightened senses. Right. So just to try to add something into that was just, it was a great, it was a great challenge for us to try to um, infuse something into that. And along with this movie, what we tried to do as well was, we wanted to make a difference between werewolves and lichens. So yeah. as you'll see in part two, uh, it's pretty much create this sort of a turf, turf war, I guess we'd say more of a, a race war. So where you have the lichens and the werewolves, but there's a lasting population of one and the other is trying to, you know, come about. And right. so that way that you get a, 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 just a little bit more differentiation between them just to add some different wrinkles because we always want to, we always want to try to do something that um, expands on, on our storytelling abilities and, and, and try to help the audience really just get into something else, something different, something, something unique about the genre they already love. Well, from a, from a filmmaker aspect, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, I noticed uh, a recurring use of voiceover, not just from the character's perspective, if you know, they're informing the audience of their inner thinking on a particular situation, but narrative used in the most basic sense, like if they're hurting or confused. And I was just curious why, do you, why you felt the need to employ a tactic like that in setting, instead of letting the actor's emotions tell that aspect of the story. That's, that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you noticed that. Um, some people just, you know, you know, they kind of see something like that and think we're just trying to be interesting. Uh, so, <laughs> so I'm glad that it came off well, and, and for lack of a better term, I'm glad that it played well. So that's, yeah. that's great that you, you caught that. Uh, what we're trying to do in this, we're very influenced by uh, anime, Japanese animation, um, influenced by comics, and, you know, it, it's one of those things, the aspects where we feel is very interesting for character development to have have that fourth wall sort of broken to allow us to somewhat not only see it, but to hear it. It really helps uh, bring together that package that the, the characters are dealing with so many human emotions. I mean, we have werewolves, but they're dealing with human emotions and ideas of, of being normal and, and fitting in, and, and at its core, that's essentially what you know the story is based off of, and that's what every great story kind of deals with. And in Dark Moon Rising, we're really trying to focus on on giving that second tier of emotional connection to the characters to kind of help again build on the idea that you know these guys are like us; uh, they're dealing with things, and just to have that that tool, that wrinkle of dialogue and over it, it's really just harkening back to Japanese animation. You know, great, great comics, great animations like Bleach, right. uh, Dragon Ball Z, Naruto, uh, one of my favorite films, Ninja Scrolls. Uh, it's just, you know, it kind of gives you that that scene where you have the character sitting there breathing for about 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> and then you finally get a, a moment of dialogue uh, out of them, and it's like, oh, it was so epic because... <laughs> Finally, something happened, but you, you really, you know, you kind of really connect it with it. Yeah, you make the, the comparison that's anime, and it makes a lot more sense, because I'm not, I'm not particularly a big fan of anime, but now that you've mentioned that, and then I look at your movie and kind of take that into consideration, it makes a lot more sense. So that, 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 that was pretty cool. I liked that. That's great. And we, we try to, you know, do that with the outfits as well, um, trying to really infuse the different, some character details in, and, you know, Gecko has more of the uh, primal, the fur coat, the fur vest. He's just right. he's always exposed. He's mostly his hair is in his Wolverine seventies uh, throwback. If Wolverine was in the seventies, I think it'd be Gecko. And you know, trying to give him a little punk rock infusion. So a part two. You know, when Dark Moon Rising comes out August fourth, and Red, I'm sorry, on iTunes and Amazon, and then later in September in Redbox. We, we're looking forward to seeing the audience hopefully catch some of the things that you caught and. Well, Eric Roberts stars in the movie, and you've worked with him several times, and what most people aren't aware of 
is that if you're making an indie film, it's vital to try and get a known actor, if at all possible, someone who's recognizable, because mm -hmm. by having them in your movie, it makes it somewhat easier when you're looking for distribution. How did you guys meet, and what type of working relationship do you have? It's so so amazing to to even speak about someone like Eric Roberts. Because when I was growing up, just thinking about working with people like him, uh, Danny Trejo, who I've worked with on the cloth, I, I didn't imagine I would actually be in a room where I would get them directions, if that makes sense. It, it, yeah. I know it sounds weird. <laughs> it's just weird to, you know, how do you give a guy with this resume an Oscar nominated and doing things since the, for 30 years? He worked, he worked with Christopher Nolan. I mean, who am I? You know, it's like well, exactly. Nolan gave him instructions recently, and, I'm, and he's sitting here on my set, and I, I'm telling him to look camera left and give me more emotion. I mean, it's just, right. it's just <laughs> like, I don't know, I don't even know how to, to fathom that dream was. I just thank God just to, to be in, you know, I don't know, just to see that dream come to fruition with the major. But we met um, during the class, uh, he read the script, and my cast and director, Angela Griffith, said, hey, do you know Eric Roberts? Eric Roberts read the script? <laughs> like, right. he didn't throw it out? <laughs> he had time for this? Like, it was really amazing to, to think about. And she said that he was interested in coming on board. Yeah. And, I, you know, I went to SAG. And I, went, I don't know. I just did everything possible to try to get him on set. And when he came on set, funny thing, I tried to avoid him. Because I didn't want to actually answer real questions. You know, like, hey, why is... I, just, I don't know, I just imagine you asked me something I never would know the answer to. Why is your camera... Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And that, that's not the right way to do this. Or, and I go, oh, my God, I can't... I don't know how to direct Eric Roberts. He's telling me what to do, and I'm so confused. So, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I tried to avoid him, but he came up to me. He put his arms around me. He says, how you doing, boss? And I was like, I was, I was like I'm, I'm all right. I'm okay. You doing it? I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> and from that moment, he he shared something with me that I don't know. I always I keep it with me now, and it was just such a precious thing. He said, "You know, you have it." He says, "I don't know what it is, but I've worked with a lot a lot of people, and you you have it. You have it in your acting. You have it in your directing. Right. You have it. You have it in your eyes, and you know, just keep keep going. And and um, I see it. And again, I." It, you know, it was, I didn't know what to do. Part of me was going, well, maybe they told him to come over here and say that because they saw me freaking out in the corner. Or <laughs> right. and another, another part was like, wow. Again, he had no, you know, it's no nothing for him. It's Eric Roberts. It's right, like, right. Man, you know, treasure. This guy, <laughs> it's just as soon as he shows up, it, you know, it, him, Robert Duvall, seriously, when you see them on screen, they just make you better. They make the film legitimate. It, it's one of those things where I, I I personally, when I wrote something for him, or in the scene he plays Henrik, the werewolf hunter, and whenever he comes on, it's, it's, it's exactly the pages coming to life, and he right. interprets it beautifully. It, it's like a painter. And, you know, it's like I've been doing it for 30 years. Not only that, but I'm better than you probably think you would be at whatever you're doing, and it's just amazing. So it was great having him on set because I learned a lot. I learned a lot about patience, timing. He made the other actors better, and they all were, again, of course, excited to be in the scene with him to try to act off of him, to vibe off of him, to get his responses. Well, I mean, as a, as a fellow actor as well, if you're doing a movie and you suddenly you're told, okay, you're going to be doing a scene tomorrow with Eric Roberts, of course you want to do your best, so it inspires other actors to be even better, so then everybody uh -huh. bring, brings their A game. It's great. It's, it's almost, you know what, people, uh, well, I don't know, because uh, a, lot of, a lot of people now are very astute to how films are made, and, and they're very, you know, a movie's made, they know the ins and outs, the VFX breakdown, <laughs> what right. the box office. But, so, but it, what is still interesting is the onset camaraderie and the competition that it breeds, and, and it's great competition. Like, I want to like I want to take this scene to the next level, and along your point, when Eric was there, most of the actors, though, they knew their lines. I didn't right. have a line problem that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that. <laughs> there were no issues with lines that day. Everyone was there. Yeah. They knew it backwards, forwards. They were ready. It was test against, you know, test yourself against the best. It was like, I'm going to see where I am, you know, see how I, I rack up with, with the best. And so it was it's very interesting. And I think that happened the way it happened on our set, and it was great. And, and, and we had a lot of that going on, a lot, a lot of great back and forth between actors just, working at rubber band. Well, in watching your movie, I couldn't help but feel that in many ways it was a homage to American Werewolf in London, not in terms of story, but in the overall scope and the atmosphere. Was that particular movie and its director, John Landis, an inspiration to you? 
Tom Landis would be an inspiration to everyone who wants to make a film. Before, uh, you know, this generation, um, given the tools that we now have access to and the tools they have access to back when they were making films, it's, it's night and day. I, I can't even imagine the difficulty it must have been just to pull those, those films off to get the story right and, and to try to tell this kind of character. People forget that these type of stories are very difficult to pitch. You know, the American public wasn't as keen to buying into this sort of supernatural uh, feeling, this folklore, uh, the, the werewolf in, in general. I mean, it was interesting, but it was more, they, they tried to make it more of a uh, gimmicky horror thing, like Frankenstein. Right. So this was, you know, he, he was the first, he infused, well, one of the, the first authors to infuse story into the, the genre and really take it along with Wolfman, but, you know, really to, to kind of play off the ideas of the human the human side and uh, who who is the real enemy, who is the real antagonist, and who is the, who are the real protagonists. So it was very interesting to see that. And, and of course, we're influenced by that. We're influenced by the, the Twilight franchise, which is just phenomenal. We're, we're influenced by other films that uh, have great storytelling. I yeah. think I put somewhere like Perks of Being a Wildfire, one of my favorite films, Across the right. Universe, where they just mix and meld a lot of a lot of great artistic ideas to retell the story of you know, the 70s and everything that happened with the riots. And, and so it was just great to, to see that and to try to play off of other of authors and try to formulate our own unique voice. We wrote Dark Moon Rising, and, and again, this is just the first one. So the elements are going to harken back to a lot of things the audiences are familiar with. So just let them know that we're coming with familiarity and, and uniqueness, but also something that you, you can relate to and that you're used to seeing. And, you know, it makes some of the films, uh, Jurassic World just came out, just great, great homages to the first one, Jurassic Park. It, it, it just really brought you back and then also gave you the new, you know, hey, this is what we're doing. That was phenomenal. Another great author, a great artist, uh, uh, my Ava DuVernay. What's great about Ava, and she recently turned down the Black Panther franchise, but she's going to do something. That's um, right. Did I read sure. that. Yeah, she turned it down. But um, more than she's, she's too great of an of an author and an artist not to delve into other genres. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's only a matter of time before a script hits the desk and, and she gets into, you know, the sci-fi. And I would love to see her take on, you know, in this element of fantasy world and et cetera. But what I love right. about her and what she does is African-American films are usually, you know, they're very heavy, heavy-handed one way or the other. And there's neither good nor bad, from my opinion, of, of trying to, you know, kind of decipher uh, the subjectivity of it, but that's how they would perceive. And, and what she has done, t- taken subjects that would be heavy-handed, like in Selma, and allowed yeah. them to in- involve the common person who may have wanted to learn about it, but not just wanted to feel comfortable engaging in the dialogue, I guess is right. the best way to say it. And I think that, that is, it takes such tact and patience yeah, to allow... You know, us to come into that world because it's uncomfortable, and yet it's realistic, and yet it's it's authentic. And I, I think that's where you know, I draw inspiration from great authors like like her, and and just just you know, people who are able to take a subject matter, bring you involved, and, and kind of draw you in in a way that you may have not really wanted to do it. And I think Dark Moon Rising, although not as nowhere near the you know to that point of trying to deal with the subject matter that Selma was dealing with or anything along that stage, but what we're yeah. trying to do is, hey, it's werewolf, but we don't want, you know, we don't want necessarily the werewolf fan. We want the the romantic fans. We want the the older generation to feel like they're watching a story of of love and romance, of survival. Then we want the younger generation to feel like, okay, this is not just a lot of talking and, and you know back and forth. This is actually interesting, entertaining, and cool. So it appeals, <laughs> appeals to all audiences. That was our goal and our intention, and. You know, August 4th, we're excited to see how that plays out. We're excited to see, you know, the response to it and, and right. how people are. Well, I, 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 find in, I find that writers and directors in general who have a great love of horror make the best horror movies because they can interpret and borrow scenes that may have worked effectively in other such films. And I see that some of your past movies, like The Cloth, Plastic Film, and Daddy's Home, all encompass elements of horror, whether they're supernatural or man-made. When did your love and appreciation of this genre begin, and was there a specific movie that started it all for you? You know what's, what's weird is I'm actually one of the more, uh, I guess I'm, I'm the most frightened person you may meet 
I'm afraid of everything. Like, I mean, I'm, but it's, I'm not even afraid of the supernatural so much as regular stuff. I mean, there's yeah. a, a rat in the house that chewed a trap, and that's scary to me because right. it's one of those glue traps. And he chewed it, and he got out. And I'm thinking yeah. to myself, what did they infuse this rat with to <laughs> right. come up with the knowledge <laughs> to not only get out of the trap but eat the food and chew his way out of it? And this is, I mean, I don't know, that's some Jurassic World stuff to me. And, and so I'm thinking about this rat now as I'm editing, wondering where is he and what is right. he doing? Is he plotting? Is he coming up with a... A rat pack, and they're gonna pack me for the trap. It, it just going off of that. That's what, what makes it draws me into just films. Films in general, it's just so amazing. It's eighty percent of my dialogue, maybe ninety percent. We quote things all the time, and so whenever we see a great film or any movie, we just want to make. I guess in the long term, or a long way to answer that question, we just want to make audiences feel involved, engaged, afraid happy, smart. I mean, just, that is really the, at its core what draws me to any film, any genre. And uh, my past films, we made them, uh, Dad at Home, went to theaters, uh, did really well. It was, again, it was just a psychological drama, but we really wanted to play off, again, key elements that drew people in, family. It was about a father who lost his son, and he was just trying to you know, retrieve him, and the court system had failed him. So in order to get to his son, he did everything in his power. I mean, if that took killing the sheriff, it took killing the, the judge, that's what it took. So at its core, you kind of, it's a horror movie, but then it's really a, a father, so about family. And that's what we, we try to do with, with films and, and what I've tried to do it over my career thus far is try to mix and mail genres and ideas so that Dark Moon Rider, for example, can be horror and fantasy and sci-fi. Yeah, good, uh, it's a good mixture. So we can, again, just try to keep including a broader audience, a broader scope with the brush so that we're able to at least reach out to the Comic-Con fan and the horror fan, all alike, all the same, and, and everyone can feel as if we hit on elements. That's what drew, drew me in, and that's what draws me into everything, everything that we try to do. Uh, right now, we're actually in talks. We're in right. talks with a studio to do a film uh, for 2018, and I just I don't even know what talking to the studio is like, but I, it's nerve-wracking. Again, I feel like I'm going to make a mistake. Like, I'm going to say the wrong thing. It's already blowing my mind. Picture Zero Entertainment is my profession company and my producing partner, Koo. You know, we started from grassroots, and, and now we continue that element of infusion to every product that we bring. And so when we work on the studio picture, God willing, um, it works out and everything goes forward for 2018. Yeah. I hope I can delve out details in a later interview. I, I'm not going to forget Dark Moon Rising 2 and 3. We're still going to, you know, keep that at the forefront here. I'm, we're just excited to share to, to kind of share that energy that we've had coming up making films, garage, basement with friends, to now this point to where we are. So we're just blessed, and, and we just praise God for an opportunity to thank the audience and, and people who helped us uh, by supporting our projects. Folks, today we've been talking with Justin Price. He is the writer and director of the new horror film Bad Moon Rising, which is released on digital and DVD on August 4th, courtesy of Uncorked Entertainment. Uh, Justin, thanks so much for your time, and I really hope that this bigger project, I know you've got your um, the smaller projects you're working on, but I hope that the, the studio project you talked about really takes off. That would be, that'd be such a blessing for you. Oh, yes, it is. Thank you so much. And Dark Moon Rising is, is going to, you know, I think that is, that's how it's going to always keep us in a right space, keep us humble, keep us hungry. And every project to us is we can't wait to share it with us, and hopefully we give the audience something to grow along with us and grow along with the characters.